So welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 2021-2022 season of Everyone Has a Voice, a new beginning. The upcoming season promises to be inspiring and eventful. We have poets featuring ranging from our local poets to the 2015-2019 Poet Laureate of Boston, Danielle Legros Georges. 2017-2019 U.S. National Beat Poet Laureate Paul Richmond, Robert Knox from the Boston Globe, Laura Brown Lavoie, um, poet, farmer, and educator. And next month, Reggie Gibson, former National Poetry Slam individual champion. And that's just to name a few. A special event celebrating April Poetry Month, and those details are to follow. Plus, opening up for our future poets, our student poets will amaze and inspire you. And of course, our open mic, where the microphone is here for anyone who wants to share their stories, emotions, and our belief in one another to a welcoming audience. This year, we are adding a special feature. We will select two to three poems at each event, and at the end of our season in June, we will publish a chapbook, Poems from the Open Mic, Everyone Has a Voice, 2021-2022. This year we have, a spe we have some special events, uh, Voices of Diversity, Voices of America, and that's gonna be held November 6th, 10 poets ranging from their teens to their 70s, presenting their poems in their native tongues, then translating to English. Attendees will hear poems in languages ranging from Arabic to Irish Gaelic to Haitian Creole, plus from Bridgewater State University, the West African Drum Ensemble. Expressive healing and artistic expression workshops on how to express those feelings we keep bottled up and how to release them, whether it's poetry or music or some type of art. If you create art, you're validating yourself. And more programs are in the works. Of course, any suggestions are always welcome. Now, none of this would be possible without the man behind the curtain our director of the Brockton Public Library, Paul Engel. <laughs> and of course, his staff. They make it all possible for us to express ourselves, to show that Brockton is and will be the lighthouse that will shine a beacon for the arts. One more shout out to my co-host, Alabriosa, <laughs> and Jason Wright. Jason? <laughs> Who will introduce uh, the open mic and the features. Okay, I lied. Let's hear it for Brockton Cable Access, who will record each reading. Please show your enthusiasm for Athena. <laughs> who will always film your best side. <laughs> Are you ready? ready? Please welcome Allie. Thank you, welcome, welcome, welcome. It's great to, and exciting to know that we have a full series ahead, 2021, 2022. It's great to see the faces once again uh, of our youths, uh, of our poetry family here in the community in the city of Rockton. It's okay, Philip, to have a fib here and there. As long as it doesn't hurt anyone, it gives great knowledge to our great city of Rockton resources. Thank you again for the library, for the Cable Access Network, and all those that contribute uh, to, the, to our community for the betterment of expressive creative arts. At this time, we're gonna move forward, and I'm excited. I, I wanna see the stimulation of emotions, of lives, of our open mic poets that are gonna come and share. We have uh, two segments. 
we're going to have the youth follow after the adult poet so that they can call, go right into it, um, our youth, and express themselves in moving forward. So at this time, I want to say welcome Nancy once again. Nancy Brady Cunningham is very dedicated into coming to Everyone Has a Voice. She's an author. She can share herself. And her most inspiration is, is life, one day at a time, written format. Welcome. Okay, can you hear me? Great. So, I'm going to read a poem about my early teenage years. I was 13. We were living in a housing project in Pawtucket, and about a mile away was the Narragansett Racetrack. All us kids wanted to go, but we weren't old enough at 13. So, my parents had three rules. No boys, no cars, no track. Of course, I had seen many movies with scenes of life in England, racetracks in Ireland, and I thought that this would be truly the sport of kings. So I was dying to go. Playing the horses, first encounter. Back door closes and closes. March wind blusters against asphalt. He keeps his motor running at the edge of the heights. She spots his powder blue Ford, continental kit shining on lowered rear chassis. He leans across pushes the door wide. She slides into Heartbreak Hotel, smoldering from the dash. No boys, no cars, no track. Beats a counter rhythm in her mind. At the red light, she slouches down. A gaggle of girls from her grade keeps within the crosswalk lines, straight as the nuns from St. Teresa's. Now, he's off to slap 20 on a hot one, shouldering into the shiftless crush waving greasy bills, yelling at the cigar-chewing cashier. Her sideway glances search for wavy-brimmed hats, paisley ascots, jubilant roses strung together in a necklace. Winner take all. Afternoon light diminishes, racing forms litter the ground. He peels out onto Route 1, exhausting her MGM dreams. The project looms, red brick sameness glowering in a setting sun. Again, he parks on the outskirts. Scent of aqua velva closes in. Lips skim hers. Heat lightning flashes beneath flared skirt. 
her insides twist this way only when she sits close to Paladin. His Friday night kisses blazing through the black and white TV, touching her secret place where smell of blood fear now mingles with the steamy car windows. No have gun will travel here. Only one hand reaching for the cold metal handle. He murmurs, stay, tugs at her coat. His sweet hurricane kisses press against soft fur, dark home. She leans away, door opens out. She takes the slow, long road. She burns through the icy wind. Thank you. Thank you again, Nancy. And as we continue forward, I'm always inspired, and of course I do like haikus. <laughs> They're still with me, the shortest poetry format you can do. So as I begin to the next open mic, we have Sheila Twyman. And when I went around and I said, what's your inspiration? She says she's inspired by emotion. Naturally, our heart, our minds, our souls, we are. And what I like to do, I like to vibe with the energy of the now. So as Sheila prepares to come up, come up Sheila, I look at her attire. Very nice golden hair. I love the earrings, the green and the khaki. So I came up with a haiku that goes with Sheila Twyman. Okay, so where we are now, we are closing summer, going into fall. Closing the year, going into the new, we've overcome the pandemic, thank God. So here's my little haiku in thinking of you. <laughs> That's coming in, <laughs> inspiring some poetry to come out of me. So as the green grass passes, falling into the sands of time, birds chirping, fades away. Welcome. Thank you for that little thank you. That was nice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I've been thinking of Haiti. Haiti has had a terrible time since 2010, actually, with the first big earthquake. And then we had, an, they had another one recently, and other violent things have happened in the country. Um, I wrote this after the first earthquake. Um, it's called Aftershocks, Port-au-Prince. I'm glad that the night is over. When I lie on the ground to sleep with my ear pressed to the soil, I can hear the earth still rumbling deep in its bowels. Moans intensify in the dark, keening for the dead, chanting of prayers for the unfound never stop. The woman next to me died last night, her right arm upraised and stiff, her fingers splayed. Here I am, God. The sun adds and subtracts shadows as it slides across crumpled buildings. White dust covers everything, paints people into ghost figures, and the stench of death assaults the air. On this third day, I will look again for my sister, trapped somewhere in her pancaked school. I pray I will see her arm upraised, fingers splayed and waving, her small voice saying, here I am, here I am, I'm here, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. And we will continue on forward. Our next poet is going to be Joyce Wilson. And her inspiration is world life. World life inspired by grapes. And grapes are fruity, can be sour, it can be sweet, it can be bright, it can be dark. That is world life. Welcome, Joyce Wilson. Uh, this poem was inspired by a, um, 
a passage I read recently about Zeus, apparently in classical Greece. Uh, Zeus permitted all the rivers to run freely with wine. And then when he got angry, he took the wine out. But this is, I was just thinking about that, if the rivers were really like that. I remembered stories of the gods, the years they walked the earth and quenched their thirst by bending down and drinking from the stream, and every stream was sweet with fragrant wine. I found the forest tangled up with vines, left to themselves, in danger of decay. I'd wait until the summer breeze announced aromas of my favorite, the grape. Then I would find the nearest stream and bend down like a god to its shimmering surface and drink my fill, imagining the wine that once flowed for free an offering. That with this ingenuity, I might replicate by trampling berries, straining pulp and skins, and siphoning the juice. It would be sweet and easy soon enough. And I would find the soaring spirit in the pleasure of its warming mystery, singing through the veins of my body, a fate that I would be sure that I deserved. All right, we're going to continue forward. And we are going to blend this a little bit, and we're going to invite our youth poet. We, I've had a pleasure of a moment to speak with Tyler Grandison, and I asked Tyler, what is your inspiration? And we all know that in life, life is an inspiration, but when you have a youth with such confidence in character and the ability to be in the creative arts and form of expression, not only is he a prominent future leader role uh, into leadership, but actually he's in it right now because he is the youngest Brock, part of the Brockton Library Foundation who sits on a board. That's impressive, that's intriguing, and that's most a great way to welcome you, Tyler, to open up the open mic for the youth here today. Come on down. <laughs> so um, that's what she, it, she said, I just want to open a new world where youth can be part of the poetry family and well, experience what it's like, experience what other people experience. Ah, uh, the sight of a butterfly. Its enormous wings carry up to the sky, and those powerful flyers command it. They soar up, 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 higher than man can go. If I were one of those magnificent creatures, I would fly to unlimited places with freedom soaring at my back. I would make friends with the other butterflies and we would soar as high as we could, then fall laughing. I would eat numerous foods in this bliss my free of life, hanging out with the, up with the other creatures and flying for hours, being the happiest I'd ever been, enjoying my time as a butterfly and living my dream. That should be it. <laughs> Tyler, I continue to encourage you. And you know what the good thing about reading it twice is, is that you get to captivate, we get to captivate the poetry as it's written and it's read. And I thank you for that because when you think about our youth, at times youth, we say that let children be children and can our youth be, be youth? And with the new challenges and going back to school, you know, we still have to follow protocol. We have to wear masks. Um, we have to deal with um, the, the they, shall I say, the students have to deal with the challenges of being homeschooled for so long and get reacclimated with the structures in the school. And how can they express themselves? Let alone there's a mask covering their face, but how can they express or talk of something that they've never experienced, let alone we adults can't either. So when I think about your description, it's like a child sitting in probably in an imaginary world while your teacher is talking. <laughs> and a lot's going on in the class. If you could only be that butterfly in a moment where you can't be that youth to be young and enjoy life as it is, you can freely fly around and do as a butterfly does. That's, a, that's, that's beautifully written and, state and said. Thank you again. And with that, I want to continue forward with an open mic with our youth. I had a lovely pleasure of meeting the next youth poet uh, over the summer. 
when we uh, had a recap of um, Everyone Has a Voice, Spring Summer, uh, Anjali Andre is inspired by life. She is our fifth grader in the process of becoming an older teenager, but she's inspired by life, motivated, and empowered to come here to read and share her poem. Anjali Andre. Hi, my name is Anjali Andre, and in fifth grade, in science, science is one of the things that actually inspired me to write the poem that's called Questions I Have Now. But the questions are just spinning in my head whenever I read, whenever I do anything, whenever I sleep, anytime, anywhere. So here's my poem. Questions. Shouts and screams are not heard in dreams, or are they? Can they be heard in the park? What would you do if you were chased by a shark? There are some things that science cannot explain. There is no reframing science. How long can humans run for? Why do I crave all the cupcakes in the world but won't eat any more? Are these questions questions? Who made up rejections? Are you sure? Are you positive? Or are you not? Do you know? Do you not know? Do you want to know? Do you not want to know? All I know is that science only answers about 70% of our questions. Cameras were invented thousands of years ago to prove that an asteroid crashed into the Earth. Therefore, there was no pictures, so it couldn't have been an earthquake. Some questions have answers, but not all answers come from science. Thank you, Anjali. And you know, even as adults, we still have questions and unanswered questions. <laughs> and forever be told the truth, because that's not a fib nor a lie. <laughs> and we're going to continue forward, but um, I wanted to just inform you that, um, first again, thank you. Um, welcome Philip as a Poet Laureate for the City of Brockton, sitting uh, with the City Hall administration team, but most opening venues and doors for the arts in our city and local surrounding towns. So with that being said, the exciting is, is that it's not just for adults. We are actually in a process of preparing to look for our first youth poet laureate to sit alongside Philip to work and engage and share their thoughts and perceptions and um, so that they can embrace the youth of our community and encourage them into the arts to feel more of the level of comfortability. We can definitely share that, follow up with Philip, or after to get a little bit more insight. That's just a preview and just to let you know. So now, we're gonna take it back. We're gonna take it back to another one of our, our, our loyals, babes that comes over. Everyone has a voice. And I asked him, I said, I said, I'm looking at you, Craig Frederick. <laughs> and I see you. And what is your inspiration today? I'm just passing as a poet. So I welcome you, Craig Frederick, to come on on and pass as a poet, because the open mic is yours. Uh, what you're referring to is I've told people that I'm a, to try to pass as a poet because being a philosopher is too dangerous. They mostly just <laughs> ignore poets where they kill philosophers. So that's why I'm here today. Um, four poems, four old poems I'm not doing today is the name of this poem. Mud is alive, I can tell by the smell. Uh, when writing, is like fighting wildcats. Once cat flat carried, now underpod poem. And water run royals to from Gorge Brook Bridge. Thank you very much. Uh, this is sort of a new poem. I'm gonna to try to pass it off as a poem. I have two new granddaughters since I last stood in this spot. <laughs> Miss Aaliyah Mira is three weeks old and Miss Lillian Akbar is 15 months exactly. Thank you very much. Uh, just one Quick one, since you like um, haikus. Uh, trap light is liquid, caught, twixt wet reflections, eyes. Thank you very much. Thank you. You covered that one for me, Craig. Greatly appreciate it. So we can go right into our next and final open mic. 
And welcome again, your lovely granddaughters, into this world at a great time. Bless their souls and bless your family. All righty, so who we have next? We have Jason Wright. Jason Wright is part of our community family of Everyone Has a Voice. He's also uh, has many different things going on, inspired by the, the areas and the fields of mental health, as we say, world life, life, emotions, and the challenges, and converted himself to be empowered, and also a dear colleague that does the interview and works alongside with Philip Pesaurus as well, with our adult poet. And I'm going to leave the mic open for Jason Wright. Welcome. Good to be back, huh? It was nice. It was nice. We would go outside, and it would rain, and then we would go inside, and it would rain outside. But then we're inside now. It's not raining, but it's still nice, you know? Beautiful, beautiful weather lately. Um, I saw Flogging Molly yesterday. Not a big deal. I just want to let you know, update on what I've been up to. It was good. They played with um, Me First and the Gimme Gimmies, which I know you love them. I know you know them. You, who knows them? Oh, Rick does. I was, I was just pointing at Rick. I was actually pointing at the three people in front of them, but Rick knows them, so that's awesome. Um, Flogging Flog Molly was fantastic, and um, I didn't know I was going to like it. I mean, I, I was, I, it was actually the Violent Femmes, uh, and Flogging Molly was also playing as well. And sometimes you get up on stage and you just say things and you're like, ah, crap, I'm, on, I'm in front of a camera and you just have to stop and read your first poem. So um, this, this, this poem, I'm going to read a short one. It's off of my, um, my new book, Train of Thought 2, which is a continuation of Train of Thought 1. Um, both are mezza mezza, I'll be honest with you. Not my best stuff, but this is the reason why I did this. This is one, kids, if you have a publishing company, you can put out anything you want. Let you know. And, and, and two, if you're going through like a super anxious time in your life, write about it. And then like 10 years when it doesn't matter anymore, you have like subpar books that you can sell at open mics. So, um, so this, one's, uh, <laughs> this one's called Talking to the Man Who Made Me, but I, I have a recent poem in this, uh, this, uh, this uh, digital notebook here I have called my, my, my phone, my, uh, my pen, uh, all right, this one's uh, called um, Friday is for Lovers. The weekend is for those in love. They're reborn like winged angels on a platform. On a stage, we act out this drama. The apartment floor is our curtain call. The broken silence is our audience. Our laughter is the curtains. Our sadness conducts the show. We are both alone. We are both alone in our broken home. You said to me that you have lowered your expect expectations. Congratulations, but that's not a celebration. That is your sadness and anger about your current situation. We have lived this length for too long. Our clothes no longer fit us. Our love grows dust, our life stagnant. Rust colored, warmer weather. I wish we could start over, but time does not rewind. We are both older now, and everyone has grown their love into homes and happiness. And I just went through these heartbreak poems that have no home. I will never read this to you, but I must rewrite my ending because kisses on your crying eyes make me write this like we're both stuck and refuse to admit that life is not a fairy tale, princess. A frog is still a frog and a beast is a beast and at least my empty heart will explode from the medications, the lacerations from all that cigarette smoke and you can find yourself another love in a perfect world, a world that is not pastels and paintbrushes. I hope you'll find love because I'm too lost to look. And this is my um, most recent poem. Um, I have a poetry magazine called oddballmagazine.com and um, this is, uh, and it's open to any poet, it's free. A lot of people say you should not do that, but whatever, I've been allergic to money since I've been born. So um, so it's uh, Jagged Thought 388. Um, I have a column every Tuesday, so this is 388. I'm sure I'll have a, a cake and a coffee when it, when it turns 400. Uh, Jagged Thought 388, the first line of defense. I have not put pen to paper in some time. I have written digital line after line. Now I only put pen to paper to scribble out a not-so-fine line of a not-to-do or not-to-do. That is a question, did I do it? 
scribble out that line onto the next one. I want a resurgence of ink to burst like an oil spill out of the ink quill. Will it stop? No, it never will. As long as the ticker still ticks and the clock ticks and the poet has ticks that makes these rhymes robotic, symbiotic, chaotic in distance like the poet is so far away from it. The poem in the pen is like a prisoner in a pen who has a life sentence but hasn't served one day yet, hasn't written a sentence of his play yet. I want to be so far removed from this poem that you think the subject is a jar of clay and you wonder why. Why did they choose a jar of clay? Is it biblical, like Judgment Day or a 90s band singing their souls away? Anyway, I want to be so distant from the audience that I throw rock in Antarctica and it connects in Australia to let the pros butterfly effect cause ships to wreck like friendships, battleships, and the stripper in Tucson shaking her hips or his hips love a little freak. The kiss, you sank my battleship, and that's how far removed I want to be from this poem and the pen, that it has restraining orders and a restraining order on that order, that if you were to mark it down, it would be January 1 and I would be dead and gone like a newborn in a pale windstorm flying to the edge torn. That's how far I want to be from this poem. This is a poem from uh, Train of Thought, the first one, which um, I took more time into and I actually like it. I'm not saying I don't like this one, let me just be honest with you, all right, it's not that I don't like this book. It's just like, you know when like you take a bad selfie and you're like, I'm not gonna show this to anyone. And then you're like, I'm just gonna show this to everyone. And that's just, this is a bad selfie. And, and this book is like kind of like a better selfie, like, hey, like, I'm going to handpick this book to be a better selfie. And this one's going to be like, I'm the ugliest person in the world, and you're going to find out about it. So like, that's what I did. Um, so it's like, it's like, I hate this book, but it's not I don't hate this book. It's just that I, I had to finish it, because this one started in halfway home, and this one ended all the way home. I like to start what I finish. Sometimes. All right. Um, and then uh, let's, let's uh, read one more poem um, from this, this uh, poetry book. We're going back into 20, 2010. Um, it was a different world then. It was really bad, but we didn't have to wear masks all the time, and it wasn't dystopian as this is, but that's okay. It's not that this is dystopian. It's just that Orwell would be like, told you. But, like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, uh, um, let's just read a poem, and I'll get off the stage. Uh, Train poem 710. So I got this thing, it's called thought broadcasting. I did actually, I'm very much over it. But um, not really actually. I just don't take the train anymore because, you know, I, I, I don't. So train poem number 710. 710 thought broadcast today. 710 negative thoughts to normal situations. At least 100 in the morning at the train station and depression is driving this train thought right out of rotation. And now I'm back and blind trying to unwind after the grind. My spine is tired of holding my pathetic head up. I feel like I'm in cement, demented and stuck. My mentality ferments in a cold basement where no light comes in to illuminate the empty spaces. So how was your day? Did you feel love today? I wish you do. I hope you have not only a good weekend, but a nice life where you don't feel too beaten and don't feel too stuck. I hope you never feel this defeated. I hope you're str strong enough to rise above. I hope you wish all the best of luck and the lonely find love and the sad get hugs. I hope if you don't have a lot of money that you find a lucky lottery ticket, and if you hate your job, you quit. I hope that if you're tired, you sleep well again. I hope you can still read these words that are written. I hope you can dream and your dreams are vivid, that your life is vivid. I hope that you and your wife are happy. I hope that your husband treats you good. I hope if you're lost as I am, you are one day understood. I just wish you all the best and hope I can feel like you once or twice. I hope you're happy and healthy. I wish you all the best in life. That's what I would love, to feel like the rest, instead of drowning in a world that never really relents, never lets up until you're dead. I want peace of mind like a man who finds a stone that gives him the ultimate prize. I wish you could see the world through my eyes. I wish my mind would be silent and I wore those rose-colored glasses that you do. I wish I could sleep forever and dream like someone who does who deep in love. I just wish this train ride was over so I could put this pen down. Featured poet. I am going to begin with our youth, and Philippusaurus will, uh, will introduce our adult poet. At this time, we want to welcome back Gabrielle Valentine. She is one of our youths who is now aspiring and growing to a beautiful young lady. Yes, who continued her education 
uh, is continuing in her education of liberal arts studies in Massasoit Community College, which is a college in the community in the city of Brockton. So she is a 19 year old young lady and um, she does have autism, but it doesn't stop her or prevent her from having the ability to stimulate her mind and find arti articulate ways of expressing herself. And the continuity of being able to write poetry, to come up and share on open mic or anything else that you do outside of here, you have to read in front of your classroom, share, share your writings. Uh, it continues to have her a consistency of thought process and stimulation. So I'm always excited when I see our youth that comes to the Everyone Has a Voice community family because you get to see them grow a little. Not that we don't grow anymore in height. Yes, we do not grow, we slouch. <laughs> but we can still expand our mind and continue to grow and be inspired by our youth. So Gabrielle lives in Brockton, so she's a Brocktonian. And, uh, <laughs> and proud, as Harsha says, proud. <laughs> And um, when she was in middle school, she started writing her poetry. And that's an encouragement for Anjali and Tyler. You can continue on your journey into the different stages of your life. And, uh, she, and, be, and the, she was motivated and inspired because she loved the medium so much as her words state. And over time, she uses it to express her thoughts and her feelings. Now, she's proud to be that featured youth poet. Welcome to the kickoff of 2021-2022. Thank you, that was quite an introduction. <laughs> so um, my first poem is called No More Hell and it's inspired by a um, tough time that um, I've been going through these past few months. I trusted that you wouldn't, I trusted that you wouldn't do anything, yet you put me through everything. You, <clears throat> you put me and everyone else through hell just so we could meet your little angel, your little innocent angel who I can never hate. I don't hate this lovely little cherub, but that doesn't make what you did okay. Almost four years have gone by and you haven't listened to us. You gave us an attitude, you rolled your eyes like a rebellious teenager. Despite the obvious warnings, we thought you grew up. Now, we're back in hell. We're back in hell, but I can't wait to meet your beautiful new angel. I love angels, but please don't send me back to hell. Um, here's another one that's um, a little bit more personal. Someone, someone older than me, please lift the belt. Lift the belt and slap it on my flesh so it won't be me. It won't be me causing the pain. I was so stupid and annoying as a child. Let that contempt for past me and, and let the idiotic current me swell into a deep sense of hatred. Hatred that is so strong that a mere hand hit cannot do my sins justice. Use the belt, use it. Lift it up and slap it against my skin. Slap it against my skin, slap me. Do it so that when I redirect all that trauma onto myself, it'll make a bit more sense, you know? And, I have one more called um, Change Towards the Dusk. Every evening, the sun casts colors of red, yellow, and orange as it fades away into the west. Every year, leaves begin changing into the colors of dusk before leaving the tree. They change into the mature colors of red, yellow, and orange while staying away from the world on that tree. They spend many days green on that tree, yet they mature into the exact, yet they mature in the exact same spot. Suddenly, they fly off into the sunset, somehow more ready than ever. All righty, so 
little Jason Wright is back. But, <laughs> but we're going to hold because the actual poet he's going to introduce. Yeah, I'm just introducing. <laughs> it's been nice to go up again. Um, it, you know, this has been a great feature so far, but we're, we're really about to have a real treat here. So, uh, Rick McIntyre has been a presence on the New England poetry scene for decades. He has toured extensively around the continental United States and Canada, appearing on stages as varied as New York City's New School, Boston's ICA, Portsmouth, New Hampshire's Music Hall, Lollapalooza, and the very first Legends of the Slam showcase at the National Poetry Slam in 2006 in Austin, Texas. He has also appeared at countless poetry venues festivals, and house parties. He has been published widely and has two collections of poetry, After Everything Burns and The Man at the Door. He is currently pursuing a degree and a second life in theater, having discovered at 59 what he wants to be when he grows up. <laughs> Everybody, a round warm welcome for Rick McIntyre. I thought I was going to have to stay masked the whole performance, which was great because I was going to tell you how much I like to smile. But <laughs> unfortunately, I have to. Um... So uh, that was really great open mic and, and intro poet, and now I'm intimidated. Um, I can give you some advice, though. Uh, when you do like a featured reading, you should never do a featured reading that is mostly new material. Uh, or that is fundamentally kind of depressing. Sadly, that's exactly what I've done today. So, <laughs> who knows? Could be awful, but it'll be short. Uh, that's actually on my OK Cupid profile. For <laughs> the jokes are funny, the poems are miserable. Okay. This is the first one. It's called I Am Not a Reliable Map. I have never been one place long enough to feel home. I have been found and forgotten, undiscovered every time, a countryside of ghost sightings, a blurred forgetfulness years old. I am not memory enough to be stories, even the wrong ones. You do not know my name because I have rewritten every signpost. I call the same places inside me by different names in answer to different questions. I do not keep maps given to me, except that I draw all over them, place mystery here, invent things that are not really there, but I feel their breath and heartbeat both inside of me. And when I try to give directions to lost strangers whose only crime is wanting to know something about me that can be fixed in space and rediscovered the next time in the same place, I find I often lie. I was born far too far away from whatever location I am now to be anything but lost. Should you ask me for directions, believe me, you cannot, I promise, get there. This one at least is kind of Halloween-y. It's, uh, uh, it's called The Ghost, the, sorry, The Moon Tells You It Is a Ghost Story. If I told you I was a ghost story, would you believe me? And if so, what details would sell the story so that it settles deep under the skin? Think of what that tells me about you, about fear, about the dance you do with it. What phases do I flow through acting out your fear, giving it shape, teaching it to walk upright, basking proud in my stolen and reflected light? And on the hollow fear nights where moon means nothing but a minus in the night sky, no face or fingernail, my darkest side turned towards you, which one of these faces is true? 
the leering lunacy of my cold smile, the rictus of a dead thing that knows it, looking outwards, not at the other eight planets, but at the swirl of other skulls floating around them in a dance macabre. So look at any night sky and then tell me I'm wrong, that I'm not a ghost watching you, whispering to other ghosts in the dark. I'll try to break up this um, uh, group therapy you didn't sign up for with the uh, um, a little uh, haiku. So um, a haiku written by Rick tried to be a limerick, but then it <laughs> So this is, uh, if anyone doesn't know, uh, there's an animal in Africa called the okapi that uh, nobody outside of uh, the Congo believed in until um, I guess the British probably brought home a dead one. Um, it looks like a kind of a cross between a giraffe and a zebra. That's, that's all you really need to know. This is called Sometimes Impossible is Only What You Cannot Believe. The first recorded image of an okapi is from a facade of the Apadana of Persepolis, 5th century BCE even though the European world refused to believe in it until the late 19th century. The Okapi didn't exist to a greater extent after that, any more than it existed less through all those years of being hidden from view. May 10th, 1970 is as far away from 1887 as the Congo is from fifth century Persepolis, but strange creatures do whatever is necessary to live despite distances of belief. I did not have an interest in sports as a kid. My imagination explored different heroes. But a young boy in America in the 1960s who didn't like sports as much as breathing was an unknown. I knew my adopted father felt this way. So I tried my best to show a fake interest that looked real like my dad did with me. So there I was at that epic moment in history, the last game of the 1970 Stanley Cup Finals, Bobby Orr making flying real for long enough to place the winning goal. So excited to see my father be proud of someone, and I wanted a taste of that. I said, that was as impossible as they used to think the Okapi was. His face fell. <laughs> he looked at me had no idea what I was. Um, that same uncomfortable laughter, that's what my therapist does. <laughs> so this is a poem, I'm like, this is a book I read a lot as a kid. I think it was in, if you grew up in America in the 60s and 70s, it was required reading. But I uh, glanced through it recently, and it was just a very, very different book. And I suspect the writer intended this. This is called What the Giving Tree Really Said. The way the story is always told, I was something that just grew into a state of grace for him. My arms wide, a tall body made of gift after gift after gift, in the eyes of a child, I was vast and wise, magical and endless. I was nature's green arms holding him tight and safe. So at first, I understood his every grab at my apples, hungry little climber. He carved love into my body, although it was not love for me. With age, he was enamored with money, and he needed all of my apples right now. I gave, and he took. Then he discovered house ownership, and my branches meant more to him as dead things, as means to an end. Never more would they hold fruit or be able to give shade. I gave, he took. Next, he wanted to sail the boat in a, a world in a boat made from my trunk. I was cut deep, but I never refused him, because in this story of his, I never could. My only value to my wisdom was in my many gifts. He loved me like take. 
He only thanked me when he was old, weary, sick, and frightened at the end. But even just a stump, I am still an apple tree, and I have terrible knowledge I never shared. I will feed him this cold nostalgia. I will haunt him to his grave. Where does the sidewalk end? It ends in hell. <laughs> oh, man. OK. I got to read something a little up. <laughs> I cannot do the next poem to you without having. This is a, I wanted to write a little Twilighty Zone poem, but, but without the creepy, um, horrific kind of edge they usually take. So this is called, The Shop of Lost Chances Hosts a Secondhand Sale. Place your expectations by the door when you walk in. There's nothing wrong with them, these things you want, but in this shop, they could grow heavy, become distorted, you could mistake what is right in front of you and lose. Or maybe not, either way, walk in free of that weight. Leave your baggage by the door. Now your hands are free, they can become butterflies and flutter discover wondrous possibilities you never thought existed. Have you ever wanted to be an airline pilot? This combat jacket knows bravery in every stitch. The man who wore it flew a P-38 Lightning, the greatest airplane ever. He did his service. The jacket knows he really wanted to be an artist. It hung with honor in his closet after, knowing the man was happy painting during his waning years. Or, or maybe you like band music. You wouldn't know it, but this clarinet seduced a princess. I can't tell you her name, and this happened long ago in a time where skin color made walls you couldn't climb. They met in secret, it, it was good, but they always dreamed of walking down the street together in a different world. Still, not everything here is a sad story thirsting for throat time. You see those rings? This old couple was married for 70 years. This nylon string guitar? Classical pieces Jimi Hendrix wanted to write are in there somewhere. This book, an impossible thing. It is every next novel any dead writer meant to finish or start. Here is the drum John Bonham planned for. The Japanese dishes with the erotic art, Julia Child's naughty sushi dinners. <laughs> this is a photo of a mountain a Ansel Adams would sure he, was sure he would see next. You can have all of this or anything here. Just believe it is exactly what you are looking for. Promise to take care of it. Swear you won't waste the chance someone else never had. Have it for free. Just promise it everything. And back to the pain. Um, I deal with chronic pain and um, uh, this, this may register with some people. This is called pain scale for fossils. The first thing the nurses ask every time is, are you in pain today? And I say, yes. The answer is yes. It's always yes. That's how it is with chronic pain. It's chronic noun related to time as in all of the. Still they insist. Can you give the number, the pain, a number from one to ten? And I tell them, our numbers are not the same. I want to tell them twelve or twenty, thirty plus brutal, one hundred and fang, five hundred and please stop asking, but I, tr but I try. I tell them, pain level value of one. This is both of us waking to feel this way, but what you would call a sick day, I call good morning. Let me put on this body, this weight of meat, this prison made of myself. Pain level two, good morning, it is going to rain. I know this because pain is its own forecast. Pain births itself like Phoenix mythology, weeks of fiery pain, days of quiet ash. 
Pain is a place that keeps discovering you. My doctor and I examine charts, discuss excavations. I know my body is a ruined temple because my doctor will only speak to me in dead languages. Level three, good morning, it is going to rain, but this rain burns cold. Days of different pain are at least new. You learn to appreciate variety. Level four, I am starting to lose my shape from the rain. Words sound stupid. Shit just hurts. Pain level five. This is the unsure place. The Rubicon somewhere in every day. The tipping point between has pain one. Do I return to bed or keep walking in the rain? Level six. It is raining. It is always raining or going to or threatening. My to-do lists are written with wish pencil. My to-do lists have learned not to get their hopes up. Level seven, 18 years ago, this pain kept me in bed 20 hours a day. Today, my body is heavy with coping strategy. The pain settles like silt and geology. Someday, seven will be my favorite lost world. Pain level eight, good morning. It is raining tyrannosaurs, and they're on fire. Yes, I use medical marijuana. No, I don't have any extra, level nine. Rain as doomsayer, as spitting oracle. Rain as dull prophet with sharp teeth. Rain as today and every day for decades. Rain tomorrow. You think we're both at level nine, but I was already 11 points down when we started. Pain level 10. The joke of double digits is thinking there's some limit, but th that this is bad as the pain will ever get, but the rain only ever gets harder. End game extinction event. Wow. So I cannot leave you off with that kind of just like it was a great poetry. I don't want to live afterwards, but it was a great time. Um, I'm gonna leave off with two poems to bring the energy up a little bit. This is called Another War at its End. When the rest of the world moved on in 1945, Hiru Onada did not know the war was over. He was given supplies and ammunition and this final instruction, defend Lubang Island, keep a close eye on the American forces, do this until you hear orders otherwise that come directly from me. With that, his commanding officer, Major Taniguchi, left him behind with this one last job to carry out. And Lieutenant Onoda did that one job, and for 30 years he didn't know that World War II was over, that he didn't have to fight anymore. Every time I have a drinking dream, I think about Lieutenant Onoda. It's funny how the human mind works, but I have one brain cell at least dedicated to remembering his name and story. I'm no longer upset by drinking dreams because they're dreams and do not count as real world relapses. And because another brain cell obviously was ordered once to stand guard over a vital pipeline to make sure I had uninterrupted supply of alcohol always, always available should it ever be needed and it always was every day. And like Onoda, this brain cell clung to the last order it was given to make sense of a changing world that left it behind by refusing to give up its fight. When outsiders came to the island, Onoda fired at them, the war still on as far as he knew. Authorities had to fly the retired Major Taniguchi there so Lieutenant Onoda could hear the order from him directly. Onoda turned over his sword his Arasaka rifle, the ceremonial dagger his mother had given him to use should he ever be captured. But he never was. He surrendered instead with no shame. It was 1974. His war was at last over. So on the mornings when I've finally shaken off the false jam false shame of a dream drink that never happened, I tell that brain cell, thank you. You had one job and you did it well, but now it is time for you to stop fighting, to leave the pipeline behind. It is time to come back home. Wow. 
So yeah, that, that poem uh, alludes to membership in a group that's anonymous, so I can't tell you about it. Don't ask. What the hell? Jeez. So anyway, this sponsor in this group I can't tell you about um, was trying to get me to do a gratitude list, which to me is like, why don't I just take my shirt off and get in a circle with a bunch of dudes and have a drumming circle? Like, <laughs> um, And he said over the phone, he's like, come on, you, you, you're not grateful. I'm like, oh God, don't talk to me. I'm grateful. You, you sound like hippies. And he said, you can't, you can't find one thing you're grateful for right now, one thing. So I said, yeah, I'm grateful that uh, there wasn't an asteroid the size of Nebraska and it didn't hit the earth today, ending all life. And there was dead silence on the phone. And then he said, write it down. <laughs> so that's how I started my gratitude list. The other thing I hate about them is, you know, they work. Um, so this is called Thank You, Thankful for Nothing. Uh, it's so damn easy to be truly grateful for all of my blessings that sometimes I forget to have gratitude for the things that are not and never were, and so may they never be. I'm grateful for every stupid dickhead that did not cross my path today. <laughs> oh, weird-looking mole that isn't on my cheek, thank you for the inoperable face cancer that you are not. Oh, not out of control city bus, thank you for not hopping the curb and smushing me. I'm grateful for every past lover that was not a serial killer. <laughs> and I'm grateful the question never came up in conversation. It would have been awkward. And when I first grew sick, when, when all this beauty grew disability, I had to learn how to be grateful for endless medical tests that told me nothing but eliminated a host of cancers, entire alphabets of hepatitis, diseases even far worse. I was grateful for every test that turned a negative into a positive. I'm grateful for all the illnesses I have that are killing me slowly. And take your time, <laughs> don't, don't rush on my account. But if I had never gotten sick, I never would have learned to advocate for myself or that thrill you get when you fire your first doctor. So I've stopped apologizing for being disabled. And when people ask, because they always do, why do you walk with the cane? I always say, well, if I didn't, the cane would have a hell of a time getting around by itself, wouldn't it? <laughs> or if I am just not in the mood, I say, shark attack, happy now and walk away. <laughs> Thank you, unhappy accidents I, for the near misses I never saw coming, for every shark that swam passed in the night and kept on swimming. For every guardian angel I wore down to the wing nubs. I am grateful for the meteor that wasn't the size of Nebraska and didn't hit the earth today, ending all life. Thank you, luck of the draw, skin of my teeth. Thank you, the wire, for letting me under one more time. Thank you, Facebook, for not causing face cancer. I don't know if that's actually true, but I hope so. I'm on Facebook a lot. <laughs> This is my song of gratitude to all creation for the loopholes and small odds in my favor for every bad thing that could have happened today and didn't. Oh Lord, just for today, let me be thankful for nothing. Thank you. And that is why Rick has been a presence in the New England and United States poetry scene for a little while. <laughs> so we've come to the end of another poetry reading where everyone has a voice. We want to thank Rick McIntyre and Gabrielle Valentine. <laughs> All our readers on the open mic, especially our youth poets. And most importantly, everyone who came to listen. And a special shout out to our director, Paul Ang. We will be back next month, October 16th, Saturday, 2 o'clock, Poets Time, with um, 
Reggie Gibson, who is a must-see. So thank you for coming, thank you for your poetry, and have a good afternoon. And 
especially with my writing where there were just some ideas that seem a little awkward when you talk when you talk about them in a conversation so um, so that's definitely helpful to have that mindset okay and do, do you video yourself like like um, you, you know how you come here and um, and join us and do open mic but today you were the featured poet uh, do you record yourself and upload uh, your poetry to share on um, social media? Actually, no. I used to a few years back when I started writing poetry in middle school, but uh, and uh, last year I wrote a poem, but uh, and uploaded it. But other than that, I haven't really done so. I think you're great live in person. <laughs> <laughs> We get to feel your energy and just just how you express yourself is awesome. And you are 19 now, but you're still a baby. <laughs> <laughs> and with that being said, what? let's close out with this. What can you pass along one piece of advice for other young aspiring writers, those who dream their own dreams, or even some young adults who realize that, you know, how do I begin? What What's one piece of advice? What would it be? Don't hold back anything yeah. that you're feeling you just have to put it down there because um, the poetry, your poetry, the first thing your poetry is for, the first person it's for is you, so don't ever hold back. Just very beautifully stated. Definitely, and I need to take that and apply it to myself. <laughs> <laughs> the youth in my soul. <laughs> So at this time, we would like to close. I want to thank you again for joining us. Please come back for open mic, mm -hmm. share your poetry, and let us grow with you and just see the, the, the awesomeness that comes out of your artistic ways in most that you do not allow autism to be a disability, but gives you the ability to be a great, a great inspiration to our youth mm -hmm. in the city of Brockton. Thank you, Gabrielle. It's thank a great you. Pleasure. Yes, take care. Yes. Well, Rick, uh, thanks uh, for joining us. Uh, Everyone has a voice for uh, today's reading at the Brockton Public Library. It was awesome. Thanks for having me. Uh, Rick McIntyre is uh, a presence of the New England poetry scene for decades. If you were just here, you just saw him read, and uh, we have a couple questions for him. So uh, we ask, uh, you know, as a, as a writer, what's a, what's an early experience where you learned that language had power? When I was in high school and decided to be a poet, the first thing I needed, of course, was a poet name. So I started spelling my first name different ways, which was annoying the crap out of one of my teachers, a biology teacher who was also a born-again Christian. Um, and. Uh, Finally, on the day that I had spelled it R-Y-K on a uh, homework paper, for which she took two points off, circled my name, spelling, <laughs> and she announced to the class, oh, there's going to be a pop quiz. And they were, oh, God, no. Nah. But first, I'm going to hand back these homework papers. And while I'm handing this back, you know, there's one way to go through life or another way. You can go through life the easy way, or you can make life hard for yourself. You can go along with the flow, or you can go, hey, look at me, I'm different. Eventually she got around to me, how I was spelling my name differently, and today, R-Y-K. So everyone's laughing at me, I'm feeling about this big. She goes to give the pop quiz and the end of period bell rang. And I literally went from social outcast to this cool kid everyone knew. Uh, like the toughest guy in the school got me in a headlock after class, a friendly headlock, and said, you know, you're okay. If you ever need me to beat someone up, you just tell me. And literally, people started talking to me. I went to parties. So the, the, the language was changing your name. My own name. Saying like, hey, I'm, I'm Rick with a Y. Yeah. And that, that, that was like the beginning. I mean, how, how old were you then? Uh, high school, so 17 or 18. 17. Yeah, you know, I was like you know. 30, 35, 36 when yeah, I graduated high school. I'm a, I'm, a dumb, I'm a dumb guy, so no, I'm just kidding. I, I, I don't know why I said that. I, I just, uh, I, I riff sometimes in like a ridiculous way. You know, you know how, you should cut that. Um, that was really well, well written and really well said. Um, so when you were, 
like, so let's go back to like when you were 17, you know, you changed your name to Rick. Are they having poetry jams and stuff at the, at the high school and you're back reading out loud? Back then we were lucky to have one creative writing class as an elective in senior year. Yeah. Um, most people took it as just an easy class. Uh, but they actually, uh, the teacher was named Patricia Rosenfeld, uh, published poet, and first class we had, she played us, Rasan Roland Kirk, taught us about circular breathing and then told us to get out of there and write a poem. Now, uh, how, how, old, how old were you when you first like, delivered your first poem in front of I was audience? in my 20s when I, uh, after leaving college, I was living in the Boston area and I read in the, uh, I guess the Boston Phoenix about a open mic poetry thing, Stone Soup Poetry actually. Oh, the Stone Soup Poetry. The Stone Soup, which at the time was at a place called the Peter Piper Restaurant on Mass Ave. Uh, and that was every Monday night, and that was the first time I got up in front of an audience and read my poetry. Was that the one hosted by Jack Power? Yep. Yep. So had you met Jack? Like, like was that like? That was when I met him. Early on, early on. Yeah, Jack that was like nineteen eighty one. Yeah, him, yeah, so. yeah. That's cool. That's cool. So, um, can you take us back to the moment when you were, you know, reading your poem for the first time? You're like, this is this is cool. Like, people like what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and and then to get money for doing. Poetry feature that was pretty cool too. Um, not a lot of money for those of you out there thinking like career poetry. No, yeah, carpentry, um, graphic design, or something. Or uh, this Bitcoin thing is very. But it was cool. Big people Bitcoin. clapped. People came up, said they liked different lines. You know. Yeah. I was hanging out with other poets in the city. Yeah, yeah. it was amazing. Okay. Nice. Um, do you, do you, do you ever perform any of that really like? Uh, Older poetry. I have a poem from. I think the oldest poem I still perform is from 1990. Yeah. Um, I have some that you know have lasted over the years, but uh, with a lot of them, as you learn to write better and better, you look at some of your early poems and you're just like, you know, like put that under the bed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm no longer <laughs> angsty. Yeah, I'm still just, angsty, but I'm yeah. 40 now. <laughs> yeah, or if you've been writing for 20 years and you're just simply better at it, and yeah. you look at an early poem and you're like, well, yeah, I wrote that before I learned well, as much. That's really interesting because you know um, we're we're talking about poetry and like when you're when you're a writer, you know, when you're a writer, you have to write a lot. I think like you mm -hmm. know you can put out a few albums. Yeah. You know, and you can <laughs> tour on those albums forever. You know, you're not going to hear the classics of someone's poetry. <laughs> right, right. That's an interesting thing, though, is, you know? you know, you hear a lot of poets, especially at open mics, and they say, oh, no, I'm not reading. I don't have anything new. And it's interesting, because when we go to see singers, and, uh, we're not like, hey, Joni Mitchell, don't do the famous song we all like. Just do all new ones we don't know, you know? Yeah. But Just, poets, they think, like, no, I can never read a poem twice. Like, yes, you can. Dylan, Dylan, Dylan Thomas gets on the stage, and they're like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can't even think of it. Uh, 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 man, it sounds so funny in my head. You know, like okay. read, uh, read, don't stop, uh, whatever you know, like, right. uh, that famous Bill Nye wrote. You know, because like I, I write a poem every single week, every single That's week. Amazing. You know, I mean, hey, I mean, what are you gonna do, right? Mm -hmm. I have a magazine, but like honestly, uh, you know, that's the thing about writing; it's a constant process. It constantly grows with you. Um, well, certainly if you want to get good at it, you have to treat it like, you know, kind of like going to the gym. Yeah. If you yeah. go dedicatedly, you will see improvement. If you don't do it for a long time and you go back to it, it will hurt. Yeah. Or actually, a better metaphor, and I use this at writing workshops, is if you open up a, like a summer cottage that's been closed for the winter and you turn on the plumbing, you have to let the, plumb, the, the faucets run. Yeah. to clean out all the shit that's gathered there during the winter, the rust, the sediment, whatever. So at first when you turn on the spigots, just this horrible black stuff comes out. Mm -hmm. But if you let it go long enough, then you get clean water. And what stops every writer I know, whether they're at their first writing workshop or you, know, you and me sitting down to write a poem, is this kind of feeling like, oh, it's not coming out perfect, forget it. I don't you know, like we expect it's gonna come out perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't written four or five months, but I'm sure it'll 
just, you know, we don't give ourselves the credit of, okay, this is going to take a little bit of time to get back, but. Do you, uh, do you like to revise a lot? Are you a big fan of re revising your, your poetry, editing it until it's I possible? do it a lot. Again, as yeah. I look back on poems I wrote, you know, five or ten years ago, I'm just a better writer now and can express things, I think, better. Some of them I like to leave alone because they are landmarks of, you know, where you were as a writer at that time. But, um, yeah, makes sense. you know, I also understand why a lot of artists don't want an album full of, oh, B-trap, B-sides and unrelated, you know, unreleased stuff. And, exactly, right. And right. it was Bruce Springsteen who fought that once in court and he was like, you know, there's, there's a reason that stuff was unreleased. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Devo, Devo had two albums. They yeah. had two greatest, Devo had a greatest hits and a greatest misses. Mm -hmm. Album. Um, fun little fact: Devo was a band back in the day, uh, great band. Um, but uh, what I was talking about, like you know, going back to that idea of um, uh, the, you know, um, of, uh, you know, a writer always writing. You know, mm -hmm. he, he, the Edgar Allan Poe steps on the stage like, read the Raven. You know, like uh, don't new stuff. Read, <laughs> read the Raven. We don't hear the new stuff. All right, very old reference, but it was kind of dangling in my head for a while, but um, the thing is, if you read something influential, um, you know, you read some poems today that were very, like, influential. Um, what, what is, what's something that inspires you as an individual? Hmm. That usually comes down to a poem-by-poem -poem basis. I mean, sometimes I'll read something or I'll learn a fact and it'll just stick in my head. Yeah. Or a poem like the one about the pain scale. That was a good. That's poem. just happened over years and years of people asking me, "Well, can you express your pain in a number from one to ten? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, like, it doesn't say anything. It communicates nothing. It doesn't, you know, like different people experience pain in different ways, and pain that used to really limit me, you get used to it over. So it's just, it's an archaic bit of, uh, in the medical practice that they haven't quite figured out what to replace it with. But it's just a question that drove me so nuts that eventually I was like, you know, like in the poem I started was saying, can you give your pain a number from one to 10, 22? Mm -hmm. So I will just write that as a 10, no, it's a 22. Yeah. But from one to 10, 22, you know. So yeah. You also spoke a lot about, about gratitude it sounds like a lot of these things are things that you've gone through that you know yeah. you've shaped your poetry and stuff like that. And, you know, um, let me ask. Um, you know, in your bio it says that you'd want to that you're starting to act again mm -hmm. or, or things like that. Um, what's another art form you would use to express yourself? I mean, I mean maybe acting or something else, pottery. I don't know. Yeah. Well, well, with theater, um, I was I had returned to school because I was old and disabled and had too much free time and I had never finished a degree when I was younger so at first I went back with this grand idea that I was going to be uh, a, learn to be a substance abuse counselor and then I learned everything that's involved in becoming a licensed substitute you know licensed sub, uh, substance yeah. abuse counselor yeah. and I was like I, I sort of felt like as if I had signed up for veterinary school because I really liked like I was in way over my head. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I'll get the English degree that I never finished in my in my 20s. Mm -hmm. And I was about a year away from that and it dawned on me that, why am I getting this again? I mean, I'm completing something I never finished decades before, but with an English degree, pretty much you can write or teach. I already wrote and I had no desire to be a teacher. Uh, and so I thought, well, you know, I've got to declare a major. And I had done theater in school before I started doing poetry. It seemed, you know, and a lot of the slam poetry is very theatrical. Mm -hmm. uh, the delight in, in studying theater is, you know, slam poetry is theatrical in the same way that shouting is communication. A lot of slam poetry, is the, you know, it's, it's a one note performance. When you start shouting at the beginning of the poem, you have nowhere really to go as far as louder. Um, there's also, in poetry, 
when you're out in front of the mic, you're the center of attention and you're getting applause for the words that you wrote and are interpreting on stage. I found it's really, really a challenge to put that same energy into poetry, into words that somebody else wrote and to do it in a way that you're not trying to get people to look at me thinking, oh, there's Rick doing a great job. You want to look at that and say, oh, there's, that's the part. That's, you know, uh, Herr Schultz from Cabaret, the Jewish fruit seller, which was a part, that was the first part I had in a play when I uh, got into the theater program there. And uh, it was just an entirely different way of performing. You know, the ego, which gets fed a lot in, in poetry, and especially slam poetry, because there's the whole winning or losing that's tied up in it. Um, you really learn to put your ego aside for the art. Um, if you want to be a good actor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes a small part is so much fun. It's, it's almost like unlearning a lot of the lessons about ego that I learned in slam poetry. Cool. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, um, writing in art and uh, now acting is one of your real passions, it sounds like. Yeah, they always have been, and I have whittled away. I, I wrote one play, um, and, you know, it's a, we did a, a, a recorded staged reading of it and it's it's clunky and it, it needs many more drafts but it was it was kind of neat to learn you know it's an entirely different kind of writing mm -hmm. it is very much uh, alluding to and not saying things um, as directly as we do in, 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 in poetry yeah especially in slam poetry where again you you tend to be hammering a, a I don't want to say a monochromatic message per you know, you get a lot of poems about war is bad or racism is bad, mm -hmm. and that's true, but it's a blunt statement. Yeah. And if you do a poem um, like Raisin in the Sun, you will get that, ra that racism is bad. Mm -hmm. No one has to be shouting it at you. Right. Um, and, and I just, I, I love that challenge of how do you express the thing without using the word and out without being, hey, I am now talking about how this is a bad thing. No, I'll, I'll tell you one thing between me and you. I find that um, when I'm up on the mic, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm pressured, and it's not not like it's not like um, it's not pressured, but like I kind of just like say things because it's my nerves. Yeah. It's, it's just how my brain works. But when when um, sometimes I say something, I'm like I wish I didn't say that, <laughs> and it's often very much the case. Yeah. But you know, in in um, acting. When you're up on the stage as well as the platform for poetry, does do you do you, when you're reading um, in front of a large audience? Do you take a how do you collect yourself in front of the mic? How do you address the crowd? Those kind of things. I think it's important um, for an artist, whether you're an actor or a poet. You realize that the space on the stage, whether it's in front of the microphone or the whole stage, is a different time and space than when you're off stage. So whoever you are, whatever's going on in your life, you have to leave that stuff off stage. And when you get onto that stage, you are Herr Schultz in 1933 Germany. Um, and uh, I'm sorry to start the question again because I, I got off my track. Oh, okay, getting ready. Um, and I think a lot of people don't get that about poets because I don't know if you've ever had this where someone finds out you're a poem, poet and they go, oh, do a poem for me. <laughs> like we're human jukeboxes. Yeah. And I've tried to explain to people like, no, there's this whole, you know, breathing and physical kind of exercises you can go through that you prepare yourself before you step into this space that is in front of the microphone. As far as the audience, uh, I got over my nervousness by, I don't want to say insincerity, but there are tricks to appear like you're very engaged with an audience, uh, like looking just over their heads. And 
looks to everyone in the audience like, you're looking at them, but you're not meeting people eye to eye because, you know, for some people that can just freak them on stage. Like they, they forget what they're thinking. Um, and, you know, so I mean, different artists are more comfortable with, you know, interacting with the audience. Um, there's a lot of that in slam poetry that you don't necessarily get in, in the theater. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, just be aware that it's a different space. Yeah. That you need, you don't go just from one to the other without some kind of conversion time. Yeah. And um, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of Everyone Has a Voice. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you for today. It's a, a lovely day of poetry. And um, what's uh, one um, like, thing of hope you'd like to give to the camera, to the people listening right now? It's a beautiful day. I don't know if I'll get a tomorrow, so I'm just going to enjoy the hell out of today. It's a beautiful day. I don't know if I'm going to get the enjoy tomorrow. I'm going to enjoy today. Rick, thanks so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Rick McIntyre.